If you've ever ridden the Carousel of Progress, currently located at Walt Disney World, you'll come across a scene in the 1940s in which John's daughter Patty is using an old vibrating exercise machine to shed a few inches before her big Halloween party. As John points out, it doesn't actually work, and never did. What is that machine? Where did it come from? And who invented it? The vibrating belt exercise machine not only predates that 1940s scene of the Carousel of Progress, it predates all of the scenes from the Carousel of Progress. In fact, to find its origin, we have to go back to the 1860s, specifically the 1860s in Sweden. This is Dr. Gustav Zander. He was born in Stockholm in 1835, and he eventually grew up to become a physician. By the time Xander was in medical school, the world had felt the ripple effects of the Industrial Revolution. Advances in technology had changed the way developed nations manufactured products, farmed the land, and otherwise grew as a society. And while it was the tail end of the revolution, machines were still these novel additions to everyone's lives. So it was no surprise that the idea of progress through machinery would make its way to the field of medicine. Xander was one of the pioneering doctors of what he would call mechanotherapy. That very revolution that brought upon a wave of new machines also meant that less and less people were working outdoors, and that meant they weren't getting regular exercise. Xander came up with a number of machines that were designed to help people get that exercise they were missing. In 1865, he put those machines into what he called the Mechanico-Therapeutic Institute. Now, these machines fell into one of two categories. The first and more prominent group were the active machines. These were machines that users would manipulate themselves with their own muscles. To put it simply, they were in many ways just like the kind of exercise machines you might see at a gym today. So you know, Xander didn't get it all wrong. That second group of machines were passive machines. They worked in a similar way to the active machines, but instead of the user manipulating it themselves, a steam or gas engine did the work for them. Xander, as well as plenty of other doctors, believed that by stimulating the muscles externally, they'd receive the same benefits that a person would otherwise get doing the exercise themselves. Now, while we know these machines today as a sham that promised an easy way to lose weight, that wasn't originally the intention. Dr. Xander designed the machines with the idea of them being used by people with either injuries or disabilities that would otherwise prevent them from exercising normally. These passive machines were looked at as a last resort for someone who couldn't naturally keep fit or otherwise use the active machines to exercise. Xander would eventually bring 67 of his machines, 23 of them passive and using a 5 horsepower steam engine, to the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, where they were put on display in the Machinery Hall and ended up winning a gold medal from fair judges. Like many of the new inventions shown at the World's Fair, Xander's machines were seen as an example of how mechanical progress would make life easier. These machines would grow in popularity in Europe and then eventually in the United States but their complexity meant that they were relegated to fitness spas as opposed to the homes of individuals. Nearly 50 years later in 1925, they saw a resurgence in popularity when newer electrical versions were displayed at the Electrical and Industrial Exposition at the Grand Central Palace in New York City. The country was in the midst of the Roaring Twenties. The economy was booming, art was flourishing, and technological progress, including the spread of commercial electricity, was making the lives of Americans easier than ever before. So why shouldn't it also make their workout easier too? The allure of passive exercise began to take hold. These machines were no longer considered tools for the injured to exercise, but instead tools for anyone to exercise. Devices such as the Savage Health Motor claimed that the vibrations from the machine would, quote, oxidize surplus fat, as well as strengthen and tone up muscles and vital organs. There was even a smaller version called the Thor Portable Juvenator, which cost $39 and could be clamped to a doorframe and used on the go. Beyond exercise, the vibrating belt machine was sold with the promise of fighting maladies including everything from rheumatism and sciatica to high blood pressure and, quote, practically everything else of the sort. It was a cure-all, and like most cure-alls, it actually cured nothing. 
Unfortunately, like most cure-alls, that appeal of an easy fix made it popular. The popularity was so far-reaching that it was even reported in 1927 that President Coolidge had adopted use of it and replaced his iron horse machine. In a clever move to get ahead of perhaps the growing realization that these machines didn't really do anything, advertisements for them began to point out that they had to be used regularly along with a reduction in caloric intake in order to work. It was deceptively brilliant. If you followed those instructions, then you'd lose weight from eating less and think the machine worked along with it. If you didn't follow those instructions, well, then it was your own fault for it not working, not the machines. Like other exercise trends, and well, other trends in general, the vibrating belt machine would fall in and out of popularity over the following years. The 1930s brought the Great Depression, and so for many people their concerns were more about getting enough food to eat than making sure their organs were toned enough. And while John in the Carousel of Progress was level-headed enough to recognize that it didn't work in the 1940s, the machine continued to pop in and out of popularity up until the late 1960s. By then, the Walton Belt Vibrator was among the more popular brands, and the post-World War II economic and manufacturing boom meant that companies would place more of an emphasis on personal ownership of the devices rather than using them at the gym. This time around, the focus was on spot reduction, or the idea that if you used the machine on a specific area of the body, that the weight loss would occur right there. However, in 1963, the FDA finally investigated the weight loss claims made by Walton and found that the labeling and documents for the machine were misleading. Walton was forced to reword their promotional materials for the machine, and suddenly ads for the device no longer promised to help you lose weight. Of course, advertisers being advertisers, they still did what they could to imply it. Not to mention, at this point, the machine was about 100 years old, so it wasn't really necessary to advertise what it was supposed to do. People already knew. Luckily today, we're all really smart and can easily see through bogus advertising, and that's why there was never another cheap, get-fit-quick exercise machine after the Walton Belt Vibrator. Just kidding. Even today, devices are sold with the promise of letting technology do the hard work for you in that journey to lose weight. The Sportelec, the Ab Force. I mean, some of these products even use the same concept of vibration to sell the idea of breaking down fats and losing weight. Ultimately, it seems to be within our human nature to seek out easier ways to do things. And technology is a persistent aid in that journey. And to be fair, that's because it works most of the time. Technology has made it easier for us to communicate, to learn, to relax, and yes, to even stay in shape. However, at the end of the day, on that last point, we still have to put in the work. We can't just shake it away. Didn't work then, doesn't work now. Consistent at least.